outro cast. Getting this started, uh, pleasure to be speaking with all three of you. And Connor, can you walk me through, as the filmmaker, as the person who had to see all this through, how you first found Mia, how you first found George, and how we wound up with this great film? Sure, yeah, of course. I mean, the film initially came from a personal experience, which um, where I was two people close to me when I was 21. So it was about sort of trying to re-represent masculinity on screen and look at grief in a new light. Um, in the casting process, I was really lucky just to sort of find the best actor for the role, which was such a, like, a really beautiful experience of just allowing tapes to come in and essentially just find Lily and Sid really naturally. And, you know, it's as simple as... First time I met George, first time I met Mia, it was sort of a no-brainer. They were just like, had such like beautiful, natural performances. We got on as like people as well, I felt, which was really important. You know, I really felt like these are two humans that I could collaborate with and work really safely with for like the entirety of the shoot. And um, it's, it's been so great because we actually now formed like a tight friendship and, you know, so much stuff in the post of a film or the distribution where you're sort of quite closely working together. So it's been so nice to, yeah no we made the right decision right working together got it so mia how did you find connor how did i find him yes <laughs> how did you become aware of connor in the first place because uh as an industry-ish person uh, sometimes you learn about people through imdb sometimes it's an agent you never know how people find other people yeah i think the first i think it was through my agent and then i got to meet Connor, my first, because I did a tape for the film and then I got to meet with Connor and we just had so much fun, straight, like initially, like auditions are obviously always scary, but as soon as I was in there, like we had so much fun. Um, We got to really like play with the scenes and stuff like that. And like Connor said, like we just really got on as people straight away. So it's like, yes, like I'd love to be a part of this. Uh, same question at you, George. Did you know Mia? Did you know Connor? I, I knew of both of them. I've been, I, I didn't, I, I came quite a, through a non-linear route into the industry. So I thought the key thing was to just kind of know who everyone is at all times, whether that's people <laughs> in front of the camera, behind the camera. I did see the short film before I knew Connor and then met with this, uh, for this project. Um, I think I was sharing an agent at the time with uh, Rose Williams, who plays Lily in the short, very briefly. And I think I remember seeing the short around that time, really enjoyed it. Um, and I think I kind of just had to forget about it. As soon as I, I knew this tape had come in and I had reference to the short film, I was just like, okay, well, don't revisit that unless they ask you to. So I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to try and take too much away from it i think i knew what the essence was of, of, of that piece but um yeah so knew of both of them before uh fan of both of them before um so it's really nice i think there's always really nice moments that you continue to get as you work as an actor um you're always meeting people who you've been kind of secretly a fan of for a while nice well connor mm -hmm. very personal subject to say the least about this film did you have any hesitation towards putting something so personal out into the world, as opposed to just say an easy romantic comedy. Yeah, right. It would have been, um, no, do you know what? The most, I'm gonna sort of sidestep the question in a, in a way, which is that it is a really personal film and I've gone through quite a lot in, in making it and it's, you know, it's been hugely emotional, but then in the release of the film, you know, I've met so many people, you know, across the world now who have gone through similar situations and the feeling of being able to put something out there, which is so personal to me, and actually meet audiences where it's personal to them as well has been like, that's why you do it, you know, to actually hold someone's hand and talk about grief and talk about their loved ones. And, you know, yeah, it's been, it has been hard at points to write the script, but actually to have it now come out and be able to share that with people makes it easily worthwhile. Now, Mia, was a lot of special prep needed for this role? Obviously, every role has its homework to it, but some roles you do have to go method or spend weeks pretending to be somebody you're not before filming starts, et cetera. Hopefully that wasn't your experience, but was this an easier one for you, a more difficult one? Um, I think, I think for me personally, Lily is quite close to who I am as a person anyway. And um, it was kind of Lily's job throughout 
the shoot like she came in with the energy a lot of the time you know um so I kind of I was dipping in and out I was I was actually I wasn't actually on set that often so I was kind of dipping in and out and bringing that energy anyway um so yeah she felt quite close to myself so I didn't have to go entirely method but it might have seemed that way because <laughs> she was kind of similar to me good to hear same question to you George did you have to go method or is there actually a lot of you in the character and prep wasn't the the craziest role that you've had um yeah I mean definitely not method I, I don't think that's something I have the skill set to do um or the patients or my family <laughs> either like, I don't think that would be very fair on them um the the most difficult part of prep was just the physical side of things it wasn't something that was like a prerequisite for the role Connor never asked of it of me but it, it kind of made sense for me to lose a little bit of weight um during that time as much as it's not a film that talks directly about Sid's journey in and out of hospital we don't really see that I just thought it for the small moments that we do see him um, looking quite fragile and, and vulnerable, I thought that was quite important to get physically as well as, you know, um, deliver the scenes how they needed to be delivered. Um, so, yeah, just the prep on that side was a little bit tough. But otherwise, I think it was relatively straightforward. There's some really emotional days and I think they were really cathartic. I think that's what's really helpful and such a draw of, as a person being an actor and getting the opportunity to explore feelings and you can bring what you want to on, onto set that day and, and really work through them or just unearth things that you haven't previously. And yeah, we did have some really tough days that were draining, particularly with uh, Jeff and Tara who play Sid's parents. We went beyond the scenes in those. I think obviously you'll see a very, very scaled back version of them in the film. Um, but yeah, there was some really emotional days. I got an eye infection, which was great. Yeah. Wow, weight loss and an eye infection. Yeah, so it was uh, independent filmmaking. Yeah, it's happened to you like me, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Connor, uh, to us, the everyday public, this is a new movie. And for you, it's inspired by stuff you live through. You've been promoting it for a while. You saw the production through, et cetera. Are we allowed to know what's coming next from you? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to know myself as well, you know. Like, um, I've, I've, been, I've just finished a pass on my next film, on a script. So that's hopefully what's going to be next. You know, I'm, I'm very much open as well to whatever can come through the door. Um, yeah, I've been having some good meetings about that. And sort of in, in the same vein as Kindling, it's, it's got sort of um, themes about sort of about letting go of, of grief and moving on through it. I, I don't know, it's, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, not funny, but in a way, my story's time in book ended by last year, I lost a really close friend. So I've sort of, I'm in a state of, I guess, almost griefing again. So I now I'm sort of in a funny space where I'm sort of trying to re-explore it in a new light. I was 20 when I wrote in, uh, Kindling and Infinite, and now I'm sort of about to turn 30. So I'm sort of now exploring grief through my 30s. <laughs> Sounds bleak, but I'm trying to bring hope to it as well. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's that. The concise way is you're living your art. That's what we can say. <laughs> yeah, just trying to put yourself out there, you know, and be like, I'm feeling this, maybe someone else will too. Yeah. Right, cathartic to say the least. And I'm glad to yeah. hear that there's another script towards completion or at least that we will eventually see on the screen now Mia same thing at you are we allowed to know what's next or is it hey the strikes we can't talk about that <laughs> um yeah I mean obviously with the strikes um everything's quite up in the air but um we're allowed to talk about UK stuff so I have a film that's coming out I think literally in a, no, November 3rd um called how to have sex so that's coming out um but I've also just had a baby, so I'm kind of just <laughs> focusing on being mum at the moment. So you're not sleeping a lot, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, literally that, literally that. I'm just working on stringing sentences together right now, so. So, you, so you've just done a great movie with Connor about the end of life, but the reality is you're living a beginning of life at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose. That's a, that's a good way to put it. Okay, the circle of life there. And George, same thing to you. Are we allowed to know what's coming next? 
I, I don't know. I don't know where we stand with a lot of this because obviously it looks, you know, fingers crossed like we're looking at the back of these strikes and hopefully a, a quite big resolution. Um, so I would say maybe just jump on IMDb and have a look to see what's kind of going on. <laughs> um, but yeah, UK-wise, uh, I've got a really nice series coming out at the start of next year called This Town, which I'm incredibly excited to be a part of. Um, so yeah. Wow. Okay. So you all three have a lot going on. Sometimes you do these junkets and the person goes, I don't know. I don't know. What's <laughs> Not you three. So the last question, which I'm going to ask all of you, and we'll start with Connor first, has nothing to do with how great kindling is, et cetera. It's what's the last concert that you went to for fun? Music concert music concert or you know sometimes concerts aren't uh, music concerts they're experiences they're events i was i was at muse muse played at the o2 last night and i was there so i was i literally yeah a little bit hung over today to be honest because i was out there <laughs> last night so um so yeah last night at, yeah muse who opened for muse last night oh a really sick band called nova twins two girls like really punky kind of yeah very cool actually really cool band and are no, our Muse at that point where they just give you two hours of hits, or are they trying to force feed the the more interest interesting stuff in the midst of the hits? Bit of both, I guess. They got a new album, so you know, bits for that. But yeah, the hits were the hits were there too. Are they also at that phase where each member has to have a solo? So there's a six minute bass solo in the middle of the show. I I hope not. Right. Very, very much they are, yeah. Very much they are. <laughs> it's funny how sometimes bands don't learn that nobody wants the solos, but hey, hey what can you do? Uh, uh, Mia, you just had a baby, so obviously you're not clubbing uh, as much as you used to. But what's the last concert that you went to? Do you remember? I think <laughs> it's not very cool. I think the last concert that I went to was Idina Menzel live in... live in. Come on. <laughs> Nice. She's from here on Long Island. Uh, mm. you know, we could be very proud of her. For yeah, I'm a huge fan, but it was just that I, we literally went because it was just after like Frozen came out and she did um, <laughs> Let It Go Live. And I had to be there, obviously. <laughs> do, do you remember when John Travolta a couple of years ago said her name? Real? Do you yeah. remember what that name was? Nadal Dazim. <laughs> yeah. No, I just, it won. <laughs> No, yeah. When, when you see <laughs> her live, does she name. does she reference that or say that name out loud? I don't know. I don't think so, but there's definitely been like memes and stuff of it. Yeah, that's so that's... I've, I've seen it. There's no escape in it. Yeah, exactly. And and George, uh last but not least here, do you remember your last or most recent concert? I think the most recent concert that I went to would have been on the set of Kindling and I watched as a spectator. Um, oh, yeah. I genuinely think that would have been the last thing. But off the top of my head, I think I remember going to see Daniel Caesar at the O2, maybe 2019. I'm not really someone that goes. Like, I, I go to like, football events. So, oh, OK. So so yeah, what's your team? Or your, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry, it's, it's American ignorance of of soccer slash football. No, it's okay. Um, Manchester United, unfortunately. So I'm going through a bit of a rough patch. It, it's okay. We'll get there in the end. Well, they're me they're me kind of like they're kind of like the Yankees, where that's the staple team. They get the yeah. merchandise, and when they don't win the big one everyone goes they should have won the big one they spent more money than everyone else but it's also good from from a fan perspective at the moment because tickets are so hard to get for sorry guys this must be really boring tickets must <laughs> be really great. hard to get for like for united games like they tend to be you know it's a, it's a huge club but when they're playing badly people give up their tickets left right and center so i'm actually you know I, i've purchased a fair few tickets for the next few games which is great it sounds just like New York sports. The the media yeah. is happy to to pick on yes. the team, and yeah. then when they win, they love team? them. I'm sorry. Do you support an NFL team? Uh, I used to like the New York Giants, who are now going through oh. one of the worst seasons ever in baseball. There's too many games. There's 162 games, I believe, in the season, which is 
who wants to watch 162 of that's anything? That's crazy. So, of course, it's, yeah. So, so you're, not a New, to... you're not a New York Jets fan. If the Tom Tom likes them, right? Yeah. Ah, did you ever see the Curb Your Enthusiasm uh, story arc about being a Jets fan? Yeah, I've seen I've seen a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> long <Not> story, <laughs> long story short, there's a guy who who takes his life because being a Jets fan is too hard. You'll mm. hear that about New York Jets fans. But, uh, about, but apparently there was like there, apparently there's like a curse on the team or something, right? Because someone sold their soul in order to win the Super Bowl. It's crazy. It's very possible. And then when you once you go to one of their games, you can have the cheapest seat and you don't get out of there for more uh, for less than three, four hundred dollars. So uh oof. Tough to be a sports fan, whether you're a Jets fan, a Man U fan, et cetera. But mm. hey, thank you all for your time and really looking forward to whatever is coming next. Thank you for telling a really personal story, Connor, and having great people involved. Oh, thank you to these guys and thank you to you, man. Appreciate your time. Outro. Okay.